Household in Norwegian religion. Um, this is a uh, Worldviews in Nordic Society lecture by Andrew Thomas for S4 University College. And I want you to watch this by Wednesday the 19th of September. So um, we've already talked a lot about um, household in Norse religion, about how the um, a lot of the Norse gods would represent the household leader. The part of familias is what we use, this Latin expression meaning the father of the family. Um, and of course um, we know that this was broken up a little bit by the arrival of religion of Christian religion because it wasn't just Christian religion it was what we would today call Catholic religion um, namely um, shortly after the arrival of um, of this religion in Norway um, the Catholic um, Church decided to go with celibate priests but there was already um, a network of monasteries and they arrived straight away um, and we've got this situation where the um, a series of um, basically celibate people, celibate men, um, were taking important roles in um, Nordic economy because they owned a lot of land very swiftly, um, and um, and they paid um, and tax was paid to the church, the church um, tithing system. So um, that was this household system was uh, was broken up a little bit by this arrival of lots of celibate men that obviously didn't have any household but only had religious households, and of course this involved um, female um, religious agency with uh, um, with strong nuns and um, and women who could take parts other than the mother of the family. Um, which which already happened to a certain extent in Norse religion. Now, a new stepping stone to this um, was, took place in the Protestant Reformation. Um, Luther's, um, in a lot of the things that Luther did actually brought back holiness to the, um, to the household structure. Of course, the grammar of closing all these monasteries was not just to say that, um, that they are not so holy, but also to say that everything else that, um, that is not a monastery, everything else that is not celibate priests and is not particularly holy um, church hierarchy, is even more holy. It doesn't just take the holiness away from one group, it gives extra holiness to another. So. Luther particularly lay emphasis to the three. Uh, whilst, whilst before we'd had this kind of two spheres, the secular sphere and the um, and the religious sphere, the sphere of uh, monks, nuns, priests, bishops, um, and ultimately the pope, um, Luther replaced that order with um, with three holy realms. Firstly, the king, the um, or the realm of um, secular polit and politicians, but also the church order, um, which they had um, an influence upon each other. And thirdly, the household leader. The household was its own sphere and had its own authority and its own kind way of being holy. So this holiness and this whole sanctification of the family um, was was Luther's own contribution to. I guess you could say a theology of households. This meant that the um, the family was very highly valued in the Lutheran Church and in the centuries that followed the Reformation. Now in the 1700s we had the next stepping stone, the next milestone, um, whereby the households had got a particular um, particular role. Um, one of the roles was um, in the 1700s you got basically an intensification um, of the Christianity in, in, the, um, in the Nordic countries. Um, the Danish um, king um, embraced pietism um, and therefore pietism became a state affair. Now pietism is a particularly Christian form of Protestantism. The point is that in your in um, the citizens um, individual religion was meant to be more Christian, more intense. With this um, political desire we've got um, we've got an intensification of household religion. Firstly by the fact that the schools that took place basically to teach children Christianity as a preparation for confirmation, a lot of the schools took place um, in households. There weren't, uh, there weren't so many school houses, especially outside the cities. I guess the um, cities had had schools, public schools, since the 1500s, but outside um, the big um, stepping stone of the 1700s was that there were more schools and there were schools everywhere. They were compulsory for everyone, which meant that schools had to take place in households. In addition, we've got um, there is a regulation of um, religious activity outside the household. Um, if people were going to get together for religious groups, um, and, and this was happening all over Europe, conventicles, Protestant conventicles were um, springing up all over the place. And, um, and the Christian leaders, and um, the Christian politicians, of course, political leaders, were, were worried about this, and they wrote this conventicle regulation at the beginning of the 1700s. 
um, to regulate um, religious activity um, in addition to the Sunday service on a Sunday morning. Um, and the people that were allowed to have these, they were not regulating in order to put a stop to it, but just um, keeping it within orthodox forms. Now, because they actually, he actually wanted more conventicles, it was great that people were getting more and more religious. This was a good thing for the pietist king, um, so long as it was um, in good context. And the two contexts that he identified as the good context for conventicles were um, under the leadership of the priest and under the leadership of fathers, which is to say, as we know, church piety is good, um, but household piety was given its blessing, given the king's blessing. Household piety is a good thing. Now, the next uh, milestone in household piety and the household religion um, in the Nordic societies was with the modern breakthrough. And in Norway, the particular figure associated with this was Hans Nielsen Hauger. Now, he seemed, to, he seemed to think that he was doing the king's will throughout his life. He was extremely surprised that the king, um, when the king said that he... Um, that he disagreed with Hauger on this. Hauger wanted to set up can canticles, no, conventicles, not can canticles, uh, conventicles all over the place. Um, and the, what Hauger did wrong was that he was um, setting up conventicles or having meetings which were not within the household and which were not within the, um, the, the church or were not led by the priest. Um, and um, and he insisted they they were um, they were with the priest's um, permission. They clearly weren't always, um, and and that's what got him into trouble. This means that um, Hauger was breaking with the idea of church and household as the two places where um, religious activity was meant to take place. Um, and it had a great deal of other consequences. For example, um, uh, a recognition of women's religious agency. For example, uh, when when women are um, taking having religious roles which are within the context of a priest or a father, and obviously it's the man that um, that has all the control here. So Hoga had this movement of breaking out of church and household, um, and and this became a a kind of democratizing uh, movement. Um, whereby um, both women and people who were who, who were not householders, so workers and um, people who were not the heads of households, had increased religious agency. And this, of course, comes alongside a lot of other um, developments. Hauger um, lived at the beginning of the 1800s, started his work in around um, 1796, 1797, and um, and. Um, and so it was the great democratization, the century of individualization. So alongside the individualizing techniques of psychology, of statistics, of, um, of a moderate tax and, and um, individual and, and, and facilitation of um, individual economic agency, we've got this um, individual religious agency. And it's really born in this period where the idea that religion is a single person's thing, one man, one vote, but also one man standing before his God.